Welcome to the RV Podcast. This is episode 472. And in this week's episode, we're going to hear one camper's shockingly unbelievable story about RV storage theft. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Wendland, and this is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer. And uh, we have a, an amazing tale to tell you uh, about RV storage theft. We talked a little bit about getting your RV in storage. Well, this week, you're going to learn some things. Don't just leave it there. There are some things that you want to, some precautions that you want to take. We have an unbelievable story this week. It really, it really is. And I can't wait to share it all. Yeah. With you. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we've got a few things we got to take care of before that. Uh, among other things, we want to thank everybody for uh, all of your kind support uh, and uh, the kind words that you sent us as you tuned in to our very first Amazon Live report last week. Uh, we had a ball doing it. Amazon Live is a new platform that we have uh, gone to once a week or so, sometimes more as we get into this shopping season for the holidays. We're going to share the best RV camping, outdoor and tech suggestions we can find. We love to do um, product reviews, and so we'll be doing a bunch of those. We did another one last night, and we'll have more next week. So uh, do us a favor and just head over to Amazon.com slash live slash RV lifestyle, and you can follow us uh, as we do those reports. We'll do a lot of them as we're uh, getting ready for uh, the new uh, the new shopping season. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so check out Amazon Live and our links there. We'll put it in the show notes for this episode. Um, so it's been abnormally warm weather for us here in Michigan. We're still here. You're not supposed to do any serious traveling for a little bit yet. Yeah, it's going to take me a few weeks to regain my strength. And I uh, just... Uh, on the I, treadmill today. Oh, not the treadmill, excuse me. The uh, bike. The bike. You're on the bike? Treadmill uh, maybe tomorrow. She's arm wrestling me every day, and she almost pinned me today. Uh, usually she just does it in about two seconds, but... Uh, uh, you're pretty. Uh, you're doing pretty good, and we're glad to see you back uh, after uh, an unexpected little complication with what was supposed to be a routine uh, event. But that's in the past, right? Right. <laughs> Thank goodness that's in the past. Um, we've had a lot of activity. I, I think everybody is uh, on the internet planning their their travels for uh, the new year or the new season coming up because. Our RV Lifestyle Facebook group has been so incredibly busy. Do you know we're over 250,000 members of that Facebook group now? Well, let's see. How many weeks will it be till we hit 300,000? Oh, I don't know. Some weeks we have uh, a, a thousand people a, a week joining or more. Uh, we've actually had a thousand people in a day a couple of times. It's a, it's a very popular group. Uh, RVLifestyle.com slash Facebook. That's how you can find it. But uh, to kind of get an overview of what um, the hot bot button topics are this week, Wendy Boyer, who is our community manager for Facebook, has uh, the, uh, the weekly social media buzz. Hi, everybody. Have you ever wondered as you're driving out there what state has the worst roads? <clears throat> well, Michael was wondering this, so he asked the group. He thought the worst roads were probably in Tennessee, but he said he had been told that Louisiana was worse. So he asked, what do you think? Well, he sure got a lot of responses. We're talking more than 1,200 people weighing in on this and lots of strong opinions out there. Some common contenders were Michigan and Pennsylvania. They came up a lot. But we also saw California, New York, New Jersey, Colorado, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arkansas, South Carolina, Arizona. Apparently a lot of states have really bad roads. <clears throat> but to Michael's original question, it seemed that Louisiana was definitely worse than Tennessee. Next, I'd like to tell you about a question from Javier. He asked the group, is 69 too old to start RVing? And everyone, we're talking hundreds of people here, said, no, not at all. Catherine said she's 73. She just started. And she said, if you're adventurous, that doesn't appear disappear with age. 
Terry said he's more than 83, his wife is 81, they're out there full time, loving life. And Steve was like many who said, if you're fit and you're physically able, RV, go out there, you're not too old. Love that question, very encouraging, and he definitely got his answer. And then finally, the last question I'd like to share was from Paul. And he said, what's the best way to bake outside while camping? Again, lots of answers. Some said bring a smoker. Some said they just bake using their grill and put the cover on it and adjust the temperatures accordingly. But by far, the most common answer was a cast iron Dutch oven. Some people put their Dutch oven over the coals of a fire and some get very specific using those charcoal briskets that you can get. Uh, putting some underneath, putting some on top. One person even shared a chart for how many to put underneath and how many to put on top based on the internal temperature you're seeking. Again, hundreds of people responded. And what I loved about that one is all the very helpful and very specific answers people shared. So that's it for me this week. I'm Wendy Boyer, and I'll see you over at the RV Lifestyle Facebook group. You know, I think that that's very healthy for people to have a place to come together and compare notes about roads because all of us have been out there saying oh these are the worst roads ever but a place where you can come and talk yep and complain <laughs> and sometimes you just have to vent a little bit those roads are bad and i also got to say to encourage people that you're not too old to start RVing. my friend lauren phillips uh i think lauren is 94 three four or five i don't know he's He's still, he's on a, on a cross-country trip again. He just got back from Alaska, and he's on his way now to California, where he's going to spend most of the winter. Uh, he and his daughter, Beth, go. Uh, it's just amazing to watch uh, Lauren, watch Lauren go. Mr. P, as we call him. And that last story, don't you love detail people? Somebody who would count how many charcoals it takes to get a certain temperature. We love you, detail people. Thank you. You de detail people love them. The rest of us kind of go, hmm, <laughs> I've got better things I can do. All right. Hey, when we come back, we have a real story to tell you about uh, RV storage theft. You, you're not going to believe this story. And uh, hopefully you're going to learn some lessons from it. And this is coming up right after this. There is a new development coming on the market for RVers in Tennessee. It's built by the same company we bought our land from. We just went to look at it, and it is amazing. Mountaintop property, great views, big woods and trails close to the Buffalo River, like our property. Gorgeous countryside. It's only a few minutes from the Natchez Trace Parkway and an easy drive to Nashville. These are big properties, five acres and up, and the prices are great. There's even financing. We are really happy with our property. These guys do a great job. It's hard to find acreage where you can have an RV full time, especially in popular destination spots. This is your property, your way. There's electric and high speed fiber optic internet. No more crowded parks or reservations. You can stay as long as you want. Go to RVLands.net. That's RVLands.net. Welcome back, and now it's time for our interview of the week, and we've got a story you are going to want to tell others to listen to. Uh, Steve and Claudia Sorensen uh, have been uh, very active RVers. They spent uh, three months every summer traveling in their RV, and they've been doing this for the last 15 years. I mean, from Mount Rushmore to Glacier to uh, uh, Chaco Canyon, uh, up and down the American West in a 22-foot uh, Mini Winnie. Uh, they had recently remodeled it with new upholstery and curtains and paint. Uh, they were getting ready to put some solar panels on it. Uh, they expected to do that this year. When they dropped it off last year in storage, where they were going to leave it uh, over the winter, well... Let's just cut to the chase and tell you that their RV was stolen out of storage. But that is just the start of an unbelievable tale with some major lessons that we can all learn. Uh, Claudia is here to uh, help us all better understand what every RVer needs to know when storing their RV and to share her story with our audience. Here's Claudia. So we have a motorhome that we travel in for two or three months every summer. Um, for 15 years. 
And last summer, uh, last end of last summer, we stored it at an RV lot after we were finished. Stored it, uh, we picked a good lot, we thought, and stored it. We went home, and then in July, we went to pick it up, and it was gone. Our home wasn't there anymore. You know, let's stop right there for a minute. Uh, this was in California, if I'm not mistaken. This happened? It was in California. And, and your home is where? Our home is, we are legal residents of South Dakota. Although okay. we spent a lot of time in Mexico. Okay, so you 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 put it in storage, safe and secure, you thought. You come back in July to begin your travels, and it's gone. And what, it's, what did you think at uh, this point? Did, you know, a lot of things went through our minds. Being stolen was not one of them. I thought maybe someone got hit it in an accident and they had it towed. We had to wait a few hours before the tow yard was actually open because we went very early in the morning to find out really what happened. And they had no idea it was gone. They had no idea when it was gone. So we did a police report. The police did some investigation and told us that they did find our motorhome in December, uh, parked legally without license plates, and a man was living in it. Uh, the man couldn't prove that he owned the motorhome. There was no registration anywhere in the motorhome. So they let him go and had it impounded. Two days after it was impounded, the same man they caught living in it went back to the impound yard and stole it again. <laughs> Fortunately, he was, it was witnessed that he drove off the lot, so they called the police right away, and the man was arrested, prosecuted, and went to jail for six months. When do you think it was stolen? I have no idea when it was stolen. Sometime it, after what? September. September, you dropped it off. Mm -hmm. They found this guy living in your motorhome in December. Mm -hmm. He couldn't prove it was his. Right. They kicked him out and impounded the motorhome. Yes. Did the police at that point look it up because it would be there who owned this thing? Um, they didn't, since it didn't have a license plate, they ran the VIN number through California. It's, I couldn't find it. They ran it through Arizona and they ran it through Nevada. All three states didn't come up because it's South Dakota. So that's so, yeah. they impounded it. That's why they impounded it. Yeah. So I mean, we'll stop. One of the things that would be nice if there was a national database that listed all of the 50 states, wouldn't it, in yeah. that case? There is a national database because I, two days after we found all this out, I looked it up. for. A, I spent a dollar to run my VIN number, and it told me everything there is possible to know about it, including the two impounds. My wow. So so the police didn't know about this national, or they just they're not didn't allowed check. To use it. They're not allowed to use it. They're only allowed to use um, authorized lookup. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, that's okay. So the this guy, after they kick him out, somehow goes back to the same place. The no, goes back to the police impound yard. Yeah. Uh, How did he get it then? He walked right in and uh, got in it and drove away. We did have keys hidden in the motorhome. They were hidden, we thought. They were hidden really, really well. Um, they couldn't see them at all. They were inside a couch in the springs. But, you know, thieves are clever. And he, uh, we figured he found the keys. I mean, we don't know how long he was in it. I mean, it's pretty easy to break into an older motorhome. I watched about five videos showing how simple it is to break into a motorhome and how okay. you can buy the kit to break in a motorhome off Amazon for $25. But um, <laughs> I'm still reeling from all of this. So this guy just walks into the impound yard. He didn't sign any papers. He just gets in it and drives away. And there's actually two stories to that. The impound lot said that he did come to the office and he wanted to get something out of it, out of the lot. The RV, because it was his, he said it was his motorhome. And then the other story, which is on the police report, said that he just walked in, got in, and drove off. So they obviously caught him again sometime. How did that happen? They saw, they had videos in the in the office, and they saw the, the motorhome being driven off the lot, and they caught him immediately. They okay, so somebody him. said, wait a minute, this guy's taking this thing, he hasn't the paperwork. So they caught him, they sent him to jail, he got convicted. And and then what happened to the motorhome then? On um, February 3rd, 2023, they sold our $25,000 motorhome for $3,500 in a lien sale. So they sold it. 
-hmm. Where is it now? Uh, it was sold and it's re-registered in California. Um, uh, I don't know who owns it now. And All there's right. nothing you can do to get your motorhome back? Nothing I could do to get my motorhome back, no. I've done a lot of things. So I've done hours and hours of research. I've I've put um, – the very first thing that, that I researched was – how did my motorhome just get taken off the lot when it was a, supposed to be a secure lot? And I found out that they, although they are supposed to do audits of the lot, of what's there, what's not there, they don't. Um, you know, you, you have a lot that has cameras and secure fencing and codes to get in, but they don't do any good unless somebody monitors those things. And they didn't know my motorhome was gone um, they did have a note in, in the file that it wasn't there in April. They never notified me it wasn't there in April, but in the file, um, if there was a note, it wasn't there. So, um, now, yeah. Uh, I think that is the first thing that a lot of people are going to say is, wait a minute, how safe is my motorhome or my RV in storage? What have you learned and what advice would you give to people oh, that are yeah, wondering that now? Myself. I learned a lot. What, one thing is that when you store your motorhome, you want to know, you want to ask what the procedures are, what they do. This particular place had a gate that opened to get out of the storage unit. You just drive up to the gate and automatically opened. Um, so one of the things was to not have that, to have a code that you have to get in and out because a lot of storage you do that. You have to have a code to get in and out, which doesn't stop someone from piggybacking. I mean, someone can come in and you could drive right behind them. That doesn't stop. And if there's cameras and nobody looks at them, it's just not going to make any difference. Until um, maybe after the fact, they can exactly. say, oh, hey, this guy drove it out. Somebody drove it out. But exactly. that doesn't I mean, help. If they kept track or did some, they call it audits. If they kept track, even on a weekly basis, and our motorhome was gone, they could check the logs to see if we logged in with our own code. And if we didn't, then something's wrong. They should have emailed, given us a phone call saying, your motorhome's not here. Did you take it? And we'd say no. And we would have done a stolen police report eight months before, or whenever it was, not there. Wow. Wow. So one of the that problems is when the police found is there was no stolen motor. There was no stolen police report on the vehicle. Because yeah, to, add, to add insult to your injury here, you were still being billed monthly oh. fees for this, right? Every single month. I mean, not never missed a month billing me. No, no, <laughs> you're right. So, what, so go, on, go on. I just and back to the whole stories thing. So, a couple things. One, uh, a gated code lock that you need to have. And then the second thing I think that's important is uh, you, uh, you, they need to, you, you need to have some idea of what they do when people, do they check on the video feeds, right? Right. So right. you have some procedures. Right, exactly. Procedures. Huh? I did a little survey of different uh, sites to see what they did. And most of them didn't really want to tell me because it's security. But they did say they audited their, their lots. But when I said, well, what is the procedure when you audit it is there any action after it's been audited if there's a motorhome and they said well this you know there's self-storage facilities vehicles come and go all the time and i thought well, that was really good enough but <laughs> i think because we all feel your pain uh before i get to a couple more questions about preventive this stuff uh I would assume you've talked to an attorney about all of this stuff. And is there anything that you can do or any relief that you might get? Well, there's there's a few things that we did. We did complain to the California DMV and ask them how they allow this, ha this to happen. Because the storage unit is, not storage, the impound lot is required by law to send us a notice of pending lien sale um, within three days of, of, not of impounding the the vehicle, but they never did that. They didn't send that to us. They sent it to the DMV of South Dakota. Not us, not our name. They had our name. They had our license. Um, the, the DMV investigators said that we can't prove fraud, but we can say that he was negligent because he said that he couldn't read our names off the police form. That's why he didn't send it to us. 
it, the print right. wasn't, uh, you couldn't read it. I mean, that doesn't sound like a good reason, but the DMV accepted that reason. But they did tell me, they told me they're, they were negligent and it's civil matter now. And do you have an attorney that's pursuing uh, this? No, we don't, because no attorney wants to take on a $25,000 motorhome. I called a dozen attorneys. So we are suing in small claims, the storage unit and the tow yard. Well, I can tell you that everybody's watching this interview is hoping that comes off really good. Yeah. But let's see if we... For extra money, I want my motorhome. I want the expenses that have occurred with the motorhome. And I want the $5,000 worth of its belongings. Um, that we had in, and I have that itemized list and receipts for all the items. That's a good thing that I guess everybody to start off with, have an itemized list of everything that's in your motorhome. Now, what can, can RVers do themselves to make sure that it, some homeless guy can't come in and steal their motorhome off the lot like that? Off well, storage line. I did a lot of investigating after before this even this podcast, and there's really a lot of things that you can do. You can you can set your motorhome up with um, uh, wheel locks, steering wheel locks, kill switches, take the battery out, air tags. Um, there's there's a, one article said that you could cover your whole motorhome with this locking zipper cover, which would I mean, it's not foolproof, but it, I mean, if I had two motorhomes to steal, one didn't have a cover, you know? True. Yeah. And another problem that they have with motorhomes, um, in which I did a survey again with the uh, other storage design and tow yards, is that a lot of homeless people won't actually steal your motorhome. They'll live in it. They'll get in the yard. They know no one's going to be coming for it for months and months, probably. And they just live in it. If you have food stored, they'll eat it. They'll use your blankets. They'll stay there until food runs out and then find another one. That's very common. So a, a tip to prevent that would be to regularly visit your, your RV and make sure that it's okay, that, that mice aren't getting into it or, or people who will just want to use it as a place to stay. Right. Uh, again, I would just, if and I have to do it over again to store it, I would definitely on a probably monthly basis, call my storage unit and sit and ask if it's still there. <laughs> yeah. Feel it? Wow. What, what a wheel locks and steering wheel locks and removing the batteries and alarms and cameras. I mean, it just depends on your value or your motorhome, how much you want to spend. Cause you could spend thousands of dollars protecting it, or you could store it in an inside storage facility for three or $400 or more a month, depending on where you live. Now um, I'm still stunned that the police caught this guy twice, <laughs> had your motor home twice and then sold it for uh, $3,000 and a tax lien. Um, and uh, this, the, you know, the fact that the police department dropped the ball here is pretty uh, obvious as well. Two police departments dropped the ball there. The first in plan was one police department. And the second one was um, another d police department. And I did do citizen complaints uh, against both police departments that Good. they did do their, their job, their, the law, not just their procedures, but the, their procedures and the law. Um, they, they need to notify me, the registered owner, within 48 hours. Neither police department did that. One police department has sustained my, my complaint. The other one is still pending, which I think uh -huh. that we did the wrong thing. Uh, well, I uh, uh, wonder if you have any more advice to people whose uh, RVs are in storage right now, besides the fact that we just said and about visiting. Uh, your, your final thoughts on... Uh, what other people can do well um you know you think that insurance company would be the one that really needs to pay and they actually denied our claim because we failed to protect our motorhome after it was impounded even though four different agencies didn't tell us it was impounded um so you know look at the fine print of your insurance policies and nobody was going to take no lawyer was going to take on our, our insurance company it's a big insurance company um, so I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV, but it seems to me this would be a pretty easy case to win, mm -hmm. but they're not, but lawyers won't take it because it's not enough money for them. Right. It's not enough money. And also another thing we did was uh, make a complaint to the South Dakota, since we're registered, registered, um, registered there, South Dakota insurance board. 
And they told us the insurance company is right and you probably would lose because it's a it's fine print saying you have to if they get if they if your vehicle is impounded, whether you know it or not, you have to protect it. Whether you know it or not, well how, how can you well and it's I beyond have, me. And I have it's, every single police report, every letter, every phone call, every email. Um, I have everything. And it, but it took me months to get all this because nobody wanted to give me anything. Yeah. So that brings me to the the last question. Are you guys RVing still? Are you looking for a new one? We, no? will, we will be looking for a new one once we have some kind of payout from somebody. We will oh, definitely, we will start out our, I mean, 15 years, we lived in that motorhome for three months every year. We traveled all over the Western United States. It was what we looked forward to. Um, every year, we had we had a new solar panel, new battery mm-hmm. sitting at a at a at a site in Flagstaff, Arizona, that we were picking up the next day to, to install in our motorhome to upgrade our system that we had. Um, yeah. it, it was Rough. pretty nerve wracking, and it's been it's not over. It's not over. Yeah. Well, uh, a lot of our thoughts are with you guys, and uh, who knows? Maybe uh, maybe we've got some altruistic attorney out there who just knows that rights need to be made, uh, wrongs need to be made right. And uh, right, sometimes do. that's the only way to do it. You keep fighting, Claudia, yeah, and uh, and get, and don't give up RVing. We look forward to oh, seeing you on the road. Definitely not. My husband was a, worked for the Park Service for 14 years, wrote hiking guides. He's a, he's a journalist, wrote hiking guides, and we are still going to be out there backpacking and hiking and traveling. Yeah. Well, God bless you. And thank you for sharing this story. It's just a great, uh, a great example for all of our people to realize that just because it's in stories doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. Claudia, thanks thanks for being our guest. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, Claudia. That's what I love when bad things happen to make good out of it by telling others how they can prevent that from happening to them. It's going to be a very interesting uh, follow-up story, Claudia, so be sure and keep in touch with this, as we say, so we can update everybody. But uh, some big lessons there about storing your RV. All right, when we come back, the RV News of the Week. The one thing that can ruin a perfect RV trip is a bad mattress. And believe us, we know. Over the years, we've tried many, and we have found them all wanting until now. Now, we sleep on the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Quite simply, it's the best we've ever slept on. We chose a queen-size Aurora Lux medium firm mattress that arrived tightly rolled in a box. All we did was put it on the bed, unroll it, and wait for it to recover from the compression. Then we put on the sheets and the bed covers and found we slept so well that we ordered another one for our home. That's how comfortable it is. Our sleep is now so luxurious and deep that we can't imagine using a different mattress. Shipping is free. If you're disappointed with the current mattress in your RV, you owe it to yourselves to try the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Brooklyn Bedding sends out all of their RV mattresses from their own factory in Arizona. This means they're able to use premium materials at a reasonable price for you with no middleman bringing up the cost. Make sure to check out their Black Friday sale at the end of this month. It'll be their biggest deal of the year. Don't miss out on the best sleep of your life. Visit rvmattress.com slash rvlifestyle and hurry because once November's over, so are these incredible deals. Welcome back, everybody. Time for the RV News of the Week. And we've got good news to start off this week's uh, News of the Week section. Yeah. Have you noticed the gas prices are dropping? This is usual for this time of the year, but we'll take it. We're glad to have it happen. So gas prices are dropping, and AAA has been telling us about this trend. As of Sunday, the uh, national average for a gallon of gas was 337 and that's down from 342 a week ago and 365 a month ago. So, and the average price for a gallon of diesel is 436. It was almost five bucks not long ago. So, uh, that's it. Both of our RVs are diesel. Uh, the truck that tows our fifth wheel and our uh, Class uh, C Unity uh, uh, motorhome, diesel's what we have to buy. And I think I paid 429 last time. 
And as you would expect, California has the highest gas prices. You would. At 507 per gallon. And the lowest, as you would expect, Texas. Texas. 281. Um, now, typically, gas prices always go down seasonally this time of year. Uh, globally, though, prices are also declining, and, and that brings good news at the pump, uh, especially, though, for our RVers. Many of you snowbirds are getting ready to take off either uh, right around now or after the holidays. So let's hope that continues for a while. But, you know, they do go back up in the spring. Um, wildfires. We normally wouldn't be reporting wildfires this time of the year, but they are ripping through parts of the mid-Atlantic states, and we just have to put this on our news. West Virginia, their brand, the brand new uh, River Gorge National Park and preserve there. Uh, wildfires are burning in uh, War Ridge and the Bacchus Mountain areas. Uh, the War Ridge Campground, which is very popular, is closed, as well as the access road beyond the campground into the um, into the National Gorge area. Uh, there's also a big fire, a wildfire at Shenandoah National Park. Uh, the Rapidian uh, Camp, uh, Rapidan Camp, is uh, closed, along with uh, a number of other trails and areas in and near that park. And then in North Carolina, nine state parks in the western part of the state are closed to backwoods camping because of increased fire risk through December 1st. Campfire bans now in effect in 13 of their state parks. So if you're planning a state uh, a camping trip to this part of the country, the mid-Atlantic states, um, be aware. Check those fire conditions. And usually we aren't reporting on them in November like this. And next, we're going to talk about Rocky Mountain National Park. They're going to continue their timed reservation system next year with uh, timed entries required beginning May 24th and continuing through mid-October. Now, they did this back during the COVID rush in 2020, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But then they, it then they took it down last year. But um, a lot of people were pretty happy to see that come down. Why did they bring it back up? Well, they want to manage the controls yeah. and control people well, and guess. improve the visitor's experience. So it's yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's a hassle. It really is a hassle, but I guess it is necessary because so many people are using our national parks now. It's, well, they seem to think the national park people seem to think that it works and it controls people at peak times. Now, there are some times when you can uh, get around without a reservation to get in, and that is like 5 a.m. in the morning, yeah. before 5 a.m., at least at Bear Lake Road, uh, that that major corridor there, um, so you can come in a little later in the day. And then if you come later in the day, when you can't see anything. Yeah, uh, a limited number of reservations available at 7 p.m. Uh, the next day so that you can get in last minute travelers but so they have tried to be considerate to those that didn't make a reservation yep good luck <laughs> uh, uh, have you noticed that uh, campers uh, on average seem a little more patriotic than most you've noticed a lot of American flags and campgrounds oh yeah well it turns out uh, the folks at the dirt um, they, it's a, that's a, a campground app a finding app uh, it turns out that the DIRT did a survey of 4,000 campers, and they found that about 14% are all either active military or veterans. And that is double, double the American population percentage of, of veterans. So 14.8% uh, in all of all campers are veterans or active military, 6.4%. Uh, uh, um, is the and one percent active military is uh, the average for the U.S. Uh, camper, the U.S. Uh, population as a whole. So there you go. Um, hoo yah! <laughs> hoo -ray, I think, that, I think that explains why normally campground the campground experience is a very orderly and pleasant one because people are used to following guidelines on how to do things and getting along. I love seeing the American flags mm -hmm. in the campgrounds. Makes me makes me good to see that. Makes me my heart happy to see all that. All right, we got a couple of things to share. You coming up yet? The app of the week, and then uh, the questions of the week. So stay with us. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries 
that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And battle borne batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have, and they'll probably be the same on your rig too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Welcome back, and now it's time for the app of the week. And we've got a good one for you. We were talking mm-hmm. about RV stories a little while ago, and uh, actually it was one of our questions that we did on our Sunday night uh, uh, Ask Us Anything that got me thinking about this app, and it's an app that helps you find places where you can store your RV. Um, and there, it, it's re- it takes kind of like uh, like the boondockers welcome, you know, or people in their backyard that let you camp or in their back 40 or whatever. Well, this is neighbors and businesses and private owners who have storage place available. Now, some on this app, which is called Neighbor, uh, some people are, you know, storage and rooms and stuff for, you know, household things, but they also have a section there for RVs and boats and things like that. Um, it's called Neighbor and it's so simple to find. Just go to neighbor.com and you enter in your zip code and uh, you can screen by RV and you'll see all of these places. We used it last year in Florida and really liked it. Oh, we couldn't have been more pleased. And it just so happened that the person who owned the property was a state trooper. So we felt really good about it. He had security cameras up and uh, it was a good experience just for a us. Really nice, nice guy. Sometimes he has his his uh, state trooper car parked there too, which is really nice to have. Uh, but we kept our RV there. We wanted to go spend some time on a beachfront condo, and you couldn't park the RV there, so we uh, rented space through Neighbors.com with him, and we hope to do the same thing this year uh, in January or so for a while. But it's a great app, and uh, as you are traveling places, and there are times when you you know you can't park your RV where you want to be and you can rent these. Now, normally they're monthly rentals. Uh, They've got a deal. If you rent two months, you get one month, you know, discounted at many of the places, but go check it out yourself. And uh, if not, if you're not going to use it now, just write it down because you'll want that app sometime. And then you won't have to write me and say, I heard you talking about it, but I didn't write it down. Oh, but it's more fun to write you. (laughs) Write it down. Neighbor.com. It's our app of the week. All right. Now it's time for the questions of the week. And we always uh, want to encourage you to send us your feedback and your questions. Uh, our personal email address um, is Mike and Jen at rvlifestyle.com. But first we have some feedback we want to share. Okay. Do you guys remember last week that story about the bear ripping apart an, an RV, ripping all the insulation out, getting it down to the bear woods? Well, one of you out there listened and gave us the rest of the story because uh, Beth was parked in this campground. So the rest of the story. Beth says, uh, we were in the site next to this camper a few nights prior. Some people were in a cabin cooking outside and feeding a bear. They thought it was fun. The bear then proceeded to take food out of the pan. Park rangers think it was the same bear that uh, destroyed that camper. Uh, the people in this camper had food cooking inside, but they were not there. And they think that the bear was trying to get at the food. Um, sadly, officials say they're going to have to find that bear and euthanize it uh, because it, it clearly lost its uh, its fear of humans because it was being fed by irresponsible campers. So um, uh, do not feed wildlife. And Beth, thank you for uh, hearing our report and taking the time to tell us uh, that you were there and and you know what happened. We appreciate always having the rest of the story. All right, time for the RV question of the week. What do we got this week? Okay, we have a question from uh, Paul and Gina. We are full-time RV and right now are stationary. I'm still surprised how many newbies are entering the camping world. With that said, would you discuss the proper use of coach lights at night in the campground? 
I'm a work camper, and recently we have had to uh, send a text blast out to folks about lights. A motorhome turned on docking lights all night. Yeah, well, Paul and Gina, um, it's a very common complaint that you have, and uh, we can understand docking lights, by the way, are very bright. If you are in a motorhome, you might not know what those are, but they're lights usually at the uh, front of a fifth wheel, some travel trailers, they're pretty bright, and you can turn them on so you can you can see the hitch and unhooking and oar hooking, all that stuff. Um, so it is a common complaint, but, but but let's give people first the benefit of the doubt. I think in the vast majority of, of cases, people forget they left them on. They turn them on, which is fine at dusk and at dark for a little bit, but they forget and they go to bed without checking them. And they pull out, pull down their blackout shades. <laughs> they don't know that the lights are on. That's exactly what I think happens. So uh, it's a mistake. I don't think that uh, a lot of people mean anything intentional by it. They certainly are not trying to be inconsiderate, but they did forget. And so give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but uh, let's also say that in many cases, uh, people just don't care. Uh, and, and often they're newbies who, who don't know that those lights are disturbing to other people. Some people want to be stargazers. Uh, those lights sometimes keep you awake at night. And if you're in a tent... Those lights are really bright. Yeah. Uh, it's bad enough with just sometimes the the normal lights that campgrounds have on all the time. Right. Um, so uh, it just is poor etiquette to leave those lights on all the time. And we say this, I know we're going to get angry mail. Well, oh, five's my RV and if I want light, I don't want a trip going out. We'll turn, you know, if you're getting outside, turn it on or take a flashlight, even better. If you're going to go use the the restroom building or something, but you don't have to turn on all the lights. You don't have to leave twinkle lights on your awning all night long. Let's not make it daylight 24 seven. Yeah, it's just, I mean, if you're boondocking all by yourself, you can do whatever you want, but just be considerate of your neighbors. That's the thing. Now, how do you approach a neighbor who is doing this night after night? Well, gently and carefully. We just published a post on rvlifestyle.com, which is our, our travel blog, if you have a question about anything, we've written about it. Listen, thousands of articles uh, to help you with every issue and every piece of gear you might need and places to go. Please go to RV Lifestyle and check it out. We have new content every single day. A new story is published every day. But we just published one um, just, just now. So go and check it out. We'll put a link in the show notes. But just go to RVLifestyle.com and you'll find that. And just, uh, if nothing else, search for uh, Leaving Lights On and you'll find that article. But it gives you some really helpful tips on how to approach somebody cautiously, uh, friendly, polite. And uh, I learned one thing, and as we put that together, a good tactic is not to say, you left your lights on all the time. Instead of say, hey, I had a problem last night falling asleep uh, with the lights, or we had a problem, the lights were on. I don't know if you know you left them on all night. So give them the benefit of the doubt. And if people are, and there are jerks out there, you might find people who say, well, I'll leave them on if I want to leave them on. Um, take it to campground management, tell them. And uh, and if it's that nasty, if you get people that nasty next to you, just leave. What do you want to spend your time next to nasty people for? But anyway, it is a big issue. And uh, uh, Paul and Gina, you probably encounter it more than others because you're work campers and you guys probably have to get up early in the morning. And, and uh, it's not a, necessarily always a vacation for you. And those lights can make it difficult to fall asleep. We understand. Been there, done that. So. All right, that's this, this time. We'd love to hear from you. You got a question or a comment, just write us, Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening to the program. Happy trails. <laughs>